From atheism to astrophysics, from evolution to economics, from comparative religion to cults, from philosophy to politics, a voice of reason in our confused world and beacon of truth and hope in this age of uncertainty. Welcome to God and Science Foundation with physician, teacher, and evangelist, Dr. Paul Katupali. God and Science Foundation is designed to study the relationship between God and science and to defend Christian faith from a scientific perspective. Dr. Paul's teaching helps you understand the vital issues affecting our world from a biblical worldview. For today's lecture, here is Dr. Paul. Welcome back to Defender's Voice. This is Paul Katupale. Thank you very much for tuning to our channel today. Today I want to spend a few minutes discussing God and morality. Today I am going to talk to Professor Michael Shermer. It was a fascinating conversation. We talked about free speech, Jordan Peterson, meaning of life and morality. We talked about God and morality. I argued that we need God to have a coherent moral system. He argues we don't need God to have a moral system. Science and reason will do the job. A brief introduction, Michael Sharma is the founder of the Skeptics Society. He is the editor-in-chief of Skeptic Magazine. He is a professor at Chapman University. He wrote many best-selling books. So Michael Sharma, he told me that he was once a fundamentalist Christian but later became a skeptic and atheist. He is a very nice gentleman. I, as I often say, I challenge only ideas, not the individuals who hold them. You can watch our full interview on our website, www.drpaul.org. At one point, we talked about the debate between William Lane Craig and uh, Shelley Kagan. Mr. Craig, a Christian apologist, argues that morality needs a moral lawgiver and moral accountability. Professor Shelley Kagan gives a rebuttal to that argument. Forget about moral accountability. Just think about the victims now. That is enough to be moral now. Let me play a clip. You want to give them a good life now, this hour, right this very moment. They need a hug. They need love. They need attention and nourishment, physical and psychological. Not for some outcome that happens, you know, decades from now, or in, in the case of the bigger picture, billions of years from now. It matters now. It's like saying, you know, that that Hitler got away with it, and uh, you know, the Jews suffered. And if there's no God, then they suffer for nothing. And it didn't matter whether they suffered or not. Yes, it matters. It matters to them at that moment. So, where do we find meaning and purpose? Okay, my argument is doesn't, whether there's a God or not, whether there's an afterlife or not, is irrelevant. It's here. It's you and me. It's We're in this room at this moment in time. That's what counts. And we should treat each other better because it matters to us now. You know, you're a sentient being. I'm a sentient being. I can project myself into your skull and imagine what it's like to be you. You can do the same thing. Therefore, I can apply the golden rule to you and, and, and so forth. So this principle of interchangeable perspectives gives us a basis of morality. That is to say, um, there's nothing special about me. It's kind of the Copernican principle. Principle. I'm not special. And therefore, I can't privilege myself morally if I expect you to take me seriously. I have to appeal to you. I have to appeal to a system that doesn't favor me. Okay? And for centuries, I argue, particularly in the moral arc, but also in two chapters in this book, uh, that we've been kind of moving in that direction. That is the recognition that all people are equal. And by equal, I don't, I, I don't mean of outcomes or intelligence or height or anything. I mean, we're equal sentient beings deserving of the same rights. Why? Well, there's arguments about whether rights really exist in, you know, out there or not. Let's assume they don't. Let's just assume it's a pure utilitarian argument 
um, that if I want you to take me seriously, uh, I need to treat you like I want to be treated. So you heard Mr. Uh, Sharma saying it does not matter uh, what others think. You need to think about the victims. Morality is about victims. Then you will discover morality. Then he asked me, do you agree? I told him, without God, morality becomes like ice cream. Without God, morality becomes like ice cream. When I said those words, I could see an irritable expression on Mr. Sharma's face. That is understandable. Whether we are Christians or atheists or people of other religions, we all believe that moral values should be universal and objective. In Christianity, morality is our discovery. But in naturalism, morality is our invention. We did not receive it from God. We did not receive it from a moral lawgiver. We made it for our own needs. So it is like ice cream. We invented it for our needs and for our pleasure. We can create 100 different kinds of ice cream. Chocolate, strawberry, vanilla, blueberry, blackberry, butterscotch, bubblegum, banana, you name it. In the same way, there is no reason to stick to one moral system. You can create a moral system which takes victims into consideration. You can also create a moral system which takes perpetrators into consideration. You can create a moral system with racial integration. You can also create a moral system with racial segregation. You can create a moral system in which you can choose whatever sexual orientation you desire. You can also create a moral system in which that is not an option. I like chocolate ice cream. I can say chocolate ice cream is the best ice cream in the world. That's a perfectly logical statement because I liked it. There is no external reference frame to judge ice cream. Whatever you like is the best ice cream in the world. Without God, there can be no external moral reference frame. Whatever moral system you like is the best moral system in the world. Take, for example, the Chinese government, how it has imprisoned more than one million Uyghur Muslims in concentration camps. If morality is an invention, you cannot criticize the Chinese government. You can say, we the atheists in America believe in Darwinism. Evolution gave us these moral values. You put your values in a box and you wrote morality made in the USA. You sent the box to China. Now, Chinese, you follow our morality. How should the Chinese respond? The Chinese would say, thanks but no thanks. We are officially atheist nation too. We can create our own moral system and values in China. You invented your morality in America and we invent our morality in China. Converging toward this kind of universal morality uh, about universal human rights, which is why everyone is critical of the Chinese government because they're, they're violations of civil rights. And same thing with Putin's Russia and uh, you know Hungary and Turkey and so on. you have all these North Korea especially. This is why we're critical of them. Based on what? No one's appealing to the Bible or or a deity or anything like that. They're not making any appeals to the supernatural. They're just saying. You're violating civil rights. According to who? According to kind of this universal civil rights concept that we've mostly all agreed is, is true. Mr. Uh, Sharma said, no, we are universal moral rights. And that is why everyone is critical of Chinese government because of their violations of civil rights. Now, that is not true. Everyone is not critical of Chinese government. The Uyghurs are Muslims, but no Muslim nation or Arab nation 
condemned China because you don't mess with Chinese president. The Western response is also not monolithic. John Bolton recently wrote a book entitled The Room Where It Happened. He was the national security advisor for President Trump from 2018 to 19. He wrote that President Trump told Chinese President Xi that he should go ahead with building the camps, which he thought was exactly the right thing to do. Then he wrote, which meant we could cross repression of the Uyghurs off our list of possible reasons to sanction China, at least as long as trade negotiations continued. Allegedly, President Trump told President Xi, building concentration camps is exactly the right thing to do. As long as trade negotiations continued, don't worry about Uyghurs and their civil rights. To be faith to Mr. Trump, he was not alone. He was not the first one or would not be the last one to think like that. What is the right thing to do? It depends on who you ask and their values. Presidents, prime ministers, kings and queens would rather prefer good trade negotiations than worrying about the oppression of a minority group in a distant land. So Michael Shermer claims that he condemns the oppression of Uyghurs. Good. But his own president is not with him on this matter. My point is we can have Diverse, often conflicting values and opinions on every matter under the sun. You cannot say, this is universal. I asked him, who made them universal? If people from Germany, England and the United States agree on certain values, they are Western values at the best. They cannot be universal values. There is a false assumption in that notion because the West does not have one set of values. We have seen allegedly, in this case, President Trump does not believe what Mr. Michael Shermer believes. The West has anti-Semitic ideologies, racial supremacy ideologies, pacifist ideologies, non-pacifist ideologies, pro-gun, anti-gun, pro-life, pro-choice, all sorts of ideologies. The West gave us Thomas Jefferson, James Madison, Abraham Lincoln, Adolf Hitler, Winston Churchill, Benito Mussolini, racial segregationists like George Wallace, Lester Maddox. So we don't have one set of Western values or one set of Eastern values. You cannot say my values should be universal. To this point, Mr. Sharma replied with uh, quoting a, a passage from his book. Recently, he came out with this book entitled Giving the Devil His Due. It's, so counter to something like what you just argued, um, that is maybe these are just Western values, not or European values. Uh, here's how I, I, I put it. Finally, intellectual humility requires me to admit that it is possible that my entire program might be sociologically based, that is, that of weird culture. Weird is Western, educated, industrialized, rich, and democratic. Uh, taken for granted by those living in such cultures, but not necessarily by others. In other words, not universal. People brought up in European cultures are likely to make uh, different assumptions. So then I say, okay, sure, future scientists may one day discover that humans do not have an instinct to survive and flourish, that most people do not want freedom, autonomy, and prosperity, that women want to be lorded over by men, that animals enjoy being tortured, killed, and eaten, that some people like being enslaved, and that large populations of people don't object to being liquidated in gas chambers. But I doubt it. So Mr. Sharmar says, I doubt Humans would ever want slavery, torture, inequality, and gas chambers. That sounds convincing, but it is not the reality of the world we live in. As I speak, millions of people are living in slavery, 
torture, inequality, and concentration camps. Why? Because we do not think for all human beings. Our selfishness makes us to value our own desires and priorities. Then he says, through science and reason, we have followed a path of discovery that has led more people in more places to lead better lives and enjoy more moral rights, respect and consideration. Science and reason do not give us human rights. In fact, Chinese government uses most sophisticated technologies like artificial intelligence and facial recognition to maintain its oppressive methods. Human rights are about values. What you value. Reason does not tell you what you should value. Mr. Sharma then says, the ease art fallacy is a red herring. Mr. Hume, tear down this wall. Ease art fallacy came to us from David Hume, a Scottish philosopher. David Hume was a skeptic, just like Mr. Sharma. Hume was intellectually honest that his art wall cannot be climbed using a naturalistic ladder. You cannot use naturalism to climb this wall. Hume famously said, it is not contrary to reason to prefer the destruction of the whole world to the scratching of my finger. You might say, Mr. Hume, Choose the world that is 7 billion people. Sacrifice your finger. Hume replies, I don't think so. I would rather go by my emotions and choose my finger. Can emotions give us moral values? Not really. Imagine you and your friend went to a jungle. A cow is grazing grass on a green field. Then a tiger approached the cow. The tiger is going to eat this cow. The cow is non-violent. It never harms anyone. It eats grass and gives milk. The tiger is violent. It rarely gets its meals without inflicting violence. It does not donate any milk or meat. The cow is not moral for being non-violent and generous. The tiger is not immoral for being violent and selfish. Nature made both the cow and the tiger through blind processes. You might sympathize with the cow. Your friend might admire the tiger. Your emotional attachment is with the cow. Your friend's emotional attachment is with the tiger. You and your friend will leave that jungle with conflicting emotions. Whose emotions are moral? Neither. In Darwinism, you are a human animal with certain emotions. Your friend is a human animal with his own set of emotions. You cannot build a moral framework based on your emotions. Mr. Sherman says, is art fallacy is a red herring. Now, what is a red herring? A red herring is a logical fallacy. It occurs when something is introduced to an argument that distracts from the relevant issue. It consists in diverting attention from the real issue by focusing instead on an issue having only a surface relevance to the first. For example, Monica broke up with her boyfriend. She went to her mother and said, I am so hot that Todd broke up with me, mom. Her mother replied, Monica, just think of all the starving children in Africa, honey. Your problems will seem pretty insignificant then. That's a red herring. I am hot now because my boyfriend broke up with me. Thinking about the millions of starving children does not ease my pain. That is not relevant here. Mr. Sharma says, is art is irrelevant to moral discussion. But you see, he is contradicting himself. While rejecting Hume's is art, Mr. Sharma is erecting his own is art. 
he is telling chinese government how they are to, to live mr hume tear down this wall he wants to run away from david hume but in reality he is running right into hume's lap mr sherman said that that's the way it was back then even the slave owners knew it was wrong and even though they made arguments about why it was it was perfectly okay and it's enforced by the bible and so on they made all these theological arguments they knew it was wrong because that's why they had to have um jails and and guns and chains to hold them back because they to keep the slaves from escaping to freedom why would they need to do that if they really believed that not everybody wants freedom they knew that they wanted to be free they knew these these uh, africans didn't want to be enslaved that's why they had to have chains on them so i think even then they knew there was this universal desire for freedom i agree that some slave masters felt guilty about imprisoning their slaves but that is not true about the majority what was the favorite book of slave owners in the american south Aristotle's Politics It was the best selling book in the antebellum south In politics Aristotle says that slavery is natural The great philosopher declares that slaves do not have human identity and he defines a slave as a breathing piece of property that is what most slave owners believed the slaves are not human beings they are just a breathing piece of property they have no value darwin said nature made some animals as cows and some animals as tigers 2000 years before darwin aristotle said nature made some men as slaves and some men as masters the slavery was called chattel slavery why if i can own cattle why can't i own some humans you say that is our basic problem if we decide on values we will go all over the place we give equal value to some people some value to some others and no value to some others only god can give equal value to all human beings in john chapter 8 we see our blessed savior in jerusalem near the mount olives a group of men dragged a woman to the presence of our lord they shouted teacher this woman was caught in adultery the lord demands that she must be stoned what is your opinion there was silence after some time lord jesus lifts his head and says let him who is without sin among you be the first to throw a stone at her on hearing those words the bible says those men were convicted by their own conscience they were convicted by their own conscience one by one they left the scene leaving that woman in the presence of our lord jesus says to her i do not condemn you go and sin no more we see objectivity subjectivity and sensitivity coming together in that interaction first there is objectivity those men did not have objectivity they dragged this woman only only the woman to the court and let her partner go scot free they valued her male partner's life but not her life she must die but jesus visited her life yes the lord demands that this woman must be stoned to death jesus satisfied the law on her behalf on the cross jesus would pay for her sin he satisfied god's righteous law he upheld the law and he showed mercy to this woman then subjectivity Jesus looked at them and said he that is without sin among you let him first cast a stone at her you see god wraps his objective laws with subjective appeal love your neighbor as you love thyself 
in the famous Lincoln Douglas debates Abraham Lincoln asks Stephen Douglas senator what is the golden rule Douglas replies love your neighbor as you love thyself Lincoln looks at him and asks would you like to be a slave would you like to be a slave god inserted subjectivity into his objective values thirdly sensitivity they do not have any sensitivity towards her they wanted to stone her to death they wanted to see her blood but jesus showed her mercy i do not condemn you go and sin no more he was going to shed his precious blood for her sins only in jesus can objectivity subjectivity and sensitivity come together only god can bring reason emotions values and meaning of life into the moral fabric of our being atheism cannot do that there is no basis for universal moral values in atheism let us pray lord jesus we thank you this evening you the eternal son of god came to this world and you went to the cross to satisfy the righteous demands of god's moral perfection and yet you gave us forgiveness we failed in everything yet you loved us and you forgave all of our sins and we ask that you give this realization to every listener and help them to open their hearts to receive you as their lord and savior we ask this prayer in your precious name amen we thank you and we will meet you next week thank you thank you for listening to this message please visit us on www.drpaul.org that is www.doctorpaul Dot .org to learn more about Dr. Paul Katopali's medical ministry and teaching. We are a listener supported ministry. Please consider a prayerful donation to our ministry to meet our ongoing expenses. You can visit us online or call us. We look forward to hearing from you. May God richly bless you.